नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय थोकनीर उति थाकुंडन मूर्ति मान आति भीषणा थाप तथाम राशिकास मस्रु अंगारोट गारी लोचना थोक नीर उते था कुंडन मूर्ति मान आति भीषणा छापत थाम राशिकास मस्रोर अंगारोत कारी लोचना थोगनीर उति था कुंडन मूर्ति मान आति भीषणा छापत थाम राशिकास मस्रु अंगारोट गारी लोचना From the sacrificial altar pit, Murtiman, assuming a personal form, Ati, extremely, Bishana, fearsome, Tapta, molten, Tamra, like copper, Sika, a tuft of hair on whose head. Smashru, and whose beard. Angar, hot cinders, 
Udgari emitting Lochana, whose eyes thereupon the fire rose up out of the altar pit assuming the form of an extremely fearsome naked person the fiery creature's beard and tuft of hair were like molten copper and his eyes emitted blazing hot cinders his face looked most frightful with its fangs and terrible arched and furrowed brows, as he licked the corners of his mouth with his tongue the demon shook his flaming trident Damstrogyo brukuti danda katorashya svajivaya alihan srikvani nagno vidun vam stri sikim sikam twalat padbyam thala prama <coughs> nabhyam kampayan avanitalam so bhyad tavad vrito bhutair duvarkam pradaham disha on legs as tall as palm trees the monster raced toward dwarka in the company of ghostly spirits shaking the ground and burning the world in all directions tam abichara dahanam ayantam dwarka kasha Vilokya tatrasu sarve vanadaihe mrigajata. Seeing the approach of the fiery demon created by the Abhichara ritual, the residents of Dwarka were all struck with fear like animals terrified by a forest fire. Akshai sabayam kridantam bhagavantam bayat. Tura Trahi Trahi Triloke Shavane Paradahata Puram. Distraught with fear, the people cried out to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who was then playing at dice in the royal court. Save us, save us, O Lord of the Three Worlds, from this fire burning up the city. Shutvataj Janavai Lok Vaiklavyam Dristva Svanam Chasad Basam Saranya Samprahasyaha Ma Bai State Yatitam Tasmyaham. When Lord Krishna heard the people's agitation and saw that even his own men were disturbed, that most worthy giver of shelter simply laughed and told them, Do not fear, I shall protect you. Sarvasyantar bahi sakshi krityam maheshwarim vibhu vigyaya itad vighatartam parshvastam chakra the Almighty Lord, the internal and external witness of all, understood that the monster had been produced by Lord Shiva from the sacrificial fire. To defeat the demon, Krishna dispatched his disc weapon, who was waiting at his side. Purport. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti comments that Lord Krishna, playing the part of a king, was absorbed in a gambling match and did not want to be disturbed by such an insignificant matter as the attack of a fiery demon. So he simply dispatched his chakra weapon and ordered him to take the necessary steps.
ओमक्यांचनाचलाखा चक्षुरुमिधेना तस्म श्रीगुरव नम श्रीचैतनोभीषा स्थापित ये नूतल स्वयं कदम ददाति स्वापदिख वंदेह श्रीगुर श्रीजुधापतकम श्रीगुर वैष्णवश्रीजाता सहकना रघुनाथ सजीव साधम सापदूत हरिजना सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य श्रीराधा कृष्ण पद सहकना ललिता श्री विशाका हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधु दीनाबंधु जगतपते गोपेशा गोपिका खंडा राधा खंडा नमोस्तथे थप्त कांचना गौरांगी राधे वृंदाबनेश्वरी वृषभानुसुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वंशकूब्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य अथिना भावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम श्रीकृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्रीअद्वैता गदाधर श्रीवास दि गौर भक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे I'm very grateful to be back home Sri Radha Gopinath temple with all of you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. We are reading today from Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 10 Chapter 66. entitled Pondraka the False Basudev text 32 through 38 this story is filled with illustrious essential teachings that are so important for each and every one of us to understand <coughs> the shrimad bhagavatam is not just a theoretical study by which we can entertain ourselves by which we can accumulate data in the form of leelas philosophical teachings shrimad bhagavatam is meant to transform our hearts and in order f- for that transformation of heart to take place first our values must be transformed our understandings of what is valuable and what is useless should be transformed and through that process our character the way we live our moral values and especially how we treat each other how we treat other living beings because the shrimad bhagavatam is teaching us essentially that we are all eternal souls so we are all eternally servants of krishna 
And when we live to live, when we learn to live in that service spirit, and in that mood, we really try to remember Krishna through hearing about him, through chanting, through prayer, through the nine processes of devotional service, worshiping the deities, carrying out the order of the Lord, personally serving the Lord, becoming the friend and surrendering everything to the Lord. And gradually, keeping our mind fixed on the goal, we reach that goal. And what is that goal? Loving devotional service that is unmotivated by egoism, selfishness, and uninterrupted by circumstances. But there are so many pitfalls, so many challenges, distractions that will inevitably come on our path in different forms, in different guises, again and again and again, until we reach the goal. And even then, as long as we're in this material world, they will still come. The difference between a sadhana bhakta and a self-realized soul is a sadhana bhakta knows how to overcome these challenges by taking shelter of Krishna. And a self-realized pure devotee is always taking shelter of Krishna, naturally, spontaneously. Therefore, these challenges are not really a challenge. And we read about such people in Srimad Bhagavatam because we are supposed to follow in their footsteps. Mahajano yena katasapanta. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna teaches us the essential truths for self-realization. Everything required to be known is in the Bhagavad Gita. In order to realize that essence of surrendering to Krishna. But Srimad Bhagavatam takes the Bhagavad Gita even further. First, by revealing so many examples of people, how they take shelter of Krishna. And especially Srimad Bhagavatam, Mahabharata, Ramayana, all these scriptures, whether it's Hanuman, Vibhishan, Shabri, or whether it is the Pandavas, or Parikshit, or Ambarish Maharaj, or Ranti Dev, or Prahlad, or Dhruva. It's always in the context of struggle that they reveal their devotion to teach us. And then we come to the tenth canto, which is the crest jewel of all the Vedic literatures because Krishna, after so many of his various incarnations, expansions, and devotees are described, his original supreme, all-loving form is described in his pastimes with his most intimate, loving devotees. And ultimately, the love of Radha and Krishna is very specially and uniquely revealed by Shukadev Goswami. This is Srimad Bhagavatam. In today's verses and the chapter which we will begin to explore, we find the citizens of Dwarka, their dilemma. They're great devotees. It's not that common people were Krishna's family members in Dwarka. To be living with him personally, they had Aishwarya Bhava, they had the understanding and worship of Krishna's um, supremacy, no doubt. 
but they were lovers of Krishna. They were very, very elevated souls. They were Krishna's family and friends. But here it describes that even them, Krishna wanted to teach how when situations come, dangers and difficulties are going to come no matter how advanced you are. But the sign of their advancement is how they're taking shelter of Krishna immediately, spontaneously, instantly. Now, to get the citizens of Dwarka to run to Krishna, it has to be something serious. So this was quite serious. <laughs> there was a demon whose legs are as long as palm trees. And please understand, these are palm trees in the previous yuga. <laughs> so they were far bigger than the palm trees we see in Marine Drive. <laughs> and he was fiery. It describes his, his qualities of this personality. His eyes were like burning cinders. His, his whole body was gigantic and flaming with fire. And everywhere he went, massive fires were erupting. He was roaring. He was shaking his trident. He was so powerful that with every step, the earth, the ground was shaking. Have you ever met anyone who could do that? <laughs> you know, if you jump high enough on the floor of the temple, you'll feel a little choo -choo 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 -choo. <laughs> But go outside and take a step and see if they feel the ground shaking at Bhaktivedanta Hospital. <laughs> Well, this person, you know, for hundreds of miles in all directions, every step, he was very powerful and he was just making everything burn with fire. He was roaring. So the residents of Dwarka, the Shadranagati, like, like Draupadi, she was a great soul, but she turned to Krishna. Even great souls, they don't think, oh, I can just do it on my own. They turn to Krishna. <clears throat> Prahlad is a Mahabhagavat. He may not have been fearful in his situation, but why? Not because he was thinking, I'm so great, I'm an eternal soul, nothing can hurt me. Prahlad's greatness was, he was spontaneously, naturally, just totally giving his heart to Krishna. Maro birako bijo icha toha nitya dasa prati tua adhikar. Bhaktivino Thakur in his song of surrender, Manaso deho geho. He expresses this prayer Krishna, if you want to kill me, I'm ready to die. I'm, if you want to protect me, I have nothing to worry. Nothing can harm me. I'm yours. I'm your eternal servant. You can deal with me any way you please. That is his mood. So, from our perspective as devotees, if we think that because I'm a devotee, things are not going to go wrong, because the material world is a place of misery, is Krishna is the supreme controller of all controllers, and I'm chanting Hare Krishna. Therefore, the material world under Krishna's control must go according to my wish. Whether you may be laughing, but probably you have that nature, that tendency. Why? Why is this happening to me? It's inconceivable, impossible. And we, we know challenges will come. But our tendency is, now that I'm a devotee and everything is, I'm very uh, making nice advancement and Krishna's merciful and I'm taking shelter, then if there's going to be challenges, then I will be able to select which ones. 
that if you select your challenges, the ones you select are never really challenges. They're only challenges when they're the things that you really don't want. So we're thinking, why? And sometimes we become confused. Not just little things, but big things, serious things that really hurt our heart, that really are crises, that really seem like tragedies, and even tragedies we have to deal with year after year. Why is this happening to me? How is it, how is it possible? How is Krishna God? He promises to protect. Well, that's us. But we see, even the residents of Dwarka, they have to run to Krishna for impossible situations that are coming to them. And in Vrindavan, practically every day some demon was coming. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Challenges. <laughs> Even devotees create challenges. <laughs> Even the ones who are trying to serve and make you happy create challenges. What to speak of others? So it's in Vrindavan, forest fires. They're laying on the bank of Yamuna and sleeping after Krishna just completely churn their heart with anguish and bliss <laughs> when he was in the coils of Kali and then he danced on his hoods what they went through that day and then they were sleeping so nicely <laughs> fire all around about to burn all the cows to death and about to burn all their relatives to death and they turned to Krishna save us Save your cows. <laughs> Save us. <laughs> and the Indra Puja, when Krishna interfered with that, and Indra, the demigod in charge of the Swarga Loka, sent down the clouds and rains of devastation. <coughs> The Brijabhasis turn to Krishna. So, the problem is not that there's difficulties. Because difficulties pass. And we may say, well, Krishna instantly helped them. But what about me? It's taking too long. But, you know, for doctors, we know that sometimes medicine takes time. They were very healthy people. They could, they could just take shelter of Krishna very, very totally. But Prahlad Maharaj, it was happening again and again and again. And for the Prichabhasis also it was happening again and again and again. And for the residents of Dwork, it happened so many times. So it's not just one thing. And for the soul, which is eternal, Nothing really takes long in this lifetime. 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, it's a snap of nothing con considering the soul has been in this material world for countless lifetimes. And all we have to do is take shelter of Krishna in this one lifetime to become perfect. So Sharanagati, taking shelter of Krishna, this is a very important lesson. We shouldn't, our faith should not be confused due to circumstances, however inconceivable they may be. The real purpose is, whatever it may be, it's all temporary stuff, but we should take it very seriously in that this is how the material world has been designed by Krishna to help us take shelter of him. And ultimately, simply by taking shelter, we get eternal liberation in Goloka Vrindavan. And in a hundred million years from now, 
which is just a second in the light of eternity. When you're in the pasture grounds of Goloka Vrindavan with Krishna, whatever your particular relationship with him may be, whether you're a gopa or a gopi or another assistant, when you think back about the trials and tribulations you may have suffered for a few years in this world, it will think, how nice. <laughs> <laughs> how nice it helped, me, it helped bring me here. It's a small price. Yes, if it wasn't for those things happening, I may not have really surrendered from the core of my heart and felt myself helpless before Krishna, and I wouldn't be here playing with Krishna as an assistant of, of Radharani and her servants. We would all, when we think back, and we'll be there one of these days, when we think back, we'll just think, oh, how nice. I don't want to go back there, but how nice it was <laughs> that, it, that it brought me here. And if Krishna wants me to go back to share this message with others, then I'm willing. Srila Prabhupada himself, we were just in Calcutta for the 50th anniversary of Srila Prabhupada boarding the MV Jaladuta. And for the first time in my life, I went to the dockyards where Srila Prabhupada boarded Jalatuta. How many of you have been to that dockyard, to the actual dock where Prabhupada boarded Jalatuta? Well, I'd like to say we should go there on our next yatra. <laughs> but to be honest with you, the traffic is so intense there and you're going over a little bridge and you're not allowed to go in the docks because it's, you know, it's very, very security, um, government guarded and no one's allowed in unless you work there and you can only see it from the bridge and the, there's massive trucks constantly going vroom, 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 and, ah, ah. <laughs> and it's really noisy and really dirty. And I bowed down and, and my knees touched the ground. And to this day, my knees are black. <laughs> and, I, and I tried scrubbing them to get that stuff off, but they, it's like tattoos. <laughs> I never thought I'd have tattoos, but I have them on my knees. <laughs> It's not a very clean place. And I was just thinking, if we bring all devotees here, if devotees start bowing down, like, they'll get crushed by trucks. <laughs> Anyways, in that very, very simple place. Because when Prabhupada boarded Jaladuta, he wasn't like a luxury ocean liner. It's a cargo ship. There was no like passenger welcome areas and nice you know, elevators to bring him to the top. It's just an old beaten down cargo ship that's meant to take cargo and the only other people on it are the sailors who just work. And they work hard too. As a prop, I had to go through this old warehouse where all this boxes and crates were and he boarded the ship. and so many difficulties. In Calcutta, his son, Vrindavan Chandra Day, he was the only living person today who saw Prabhupada off on the ship in 1965. Only four people saw Srila Prabhupada off. And Vrindavan Chandra was one. His youngest son, he was 22 years old then, I believe. And he described, Srila Prabhupada had nothing. He just, you know, he had some books that were supposed to come and be put on the ship in coaching. And he had an umbrella. <laughs> and he had one little suitcase. 
and he had some cereal because he didn't even know if there would be any acceptable food in America when he got there. That's how, you know, no, in India, nobody really knew what was going on in America in 1965. A devotee, he didn't know if there would be anything edible for him to eat. He brought a bag of cereal. That's how he left. And we know heart attacks, and then he got to New York, and there were, and there were strokes, and poverty, and life threats, and reversals, and so many difficulties. But on the Jaladuta itself in the Boston Harbor, Srila Prabhupada wrote that beautiful poem, Markine Bhagavad Dharma. And there he describes the nature of a true devotee. That Krishna, you are the one who have brought me here to fulfill the order of my spiritual master. I have no words to speak to convince them of your message, only if you speak through me. Let me be your puppet and make me dance as you want me to dance. That principle is Vaishnavism. That's what it actually means to take shelter. Taking shelter just doesn't mean Krishna, I'm in a dangerous position, please say. Taking shelter actually means giving up our false ego. Giving up the tendency to think that I'm the controller, I'm the proprietor, and I am the enjoyer. And I am the doer. Krishna, I'm yours. That's Sharanagati. Mana so deho geho cho kichu mor arpilunt hu aupade nanda kishor in the first verse of these prayers, Bhakti Vinod Thakur is telling, my Lord, my, my body and my mind and my family and my home and all of my abilities, everything is yours. Everything is yours. And then from that beginning, he develops into Maro Biragobi. If you want, you can kill me, or if you like, you can protect me, I'm yours. He's already given himself completely. Now this story really shows, on so many levels, essential lessons for us. Because it begins with a person named Pondraka. Ondraka was obviously an extremely powerful man. He wasn't just some, I mean he was, but he wasn't. He was definitely crazy. He was definitely a fool, but he was an extremely powerful crazy fool. <laughs> you know, sometimes we, you know, we see paintings of him with, different, you know, cut out cardboard arms on himself, <laughs> and he just looks like a crazy fool. Well, he was like that, but the fact is he was the king of Karusha, which was a whole kingdom, and he was obviously powerful because he had massive armies, militaries, that would follow any command, even if he did some, even if he was crazy. He had entire militaries that took him so serious they would end their lives to fulfill his desire. And the people really considered him great. And because of his power, and because of his prestige, and because of the popularity he had among his people, he actually started thinking, I'm God. He started thinking, I am the proprietor, I am the controller, I am the enjoyer. And then something happened, which is described here in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So many people did, they, they glorified him in that way. So many people were saying, you are the greatest. 
you are Vasudev, you are God. So he had the tendency within his heart to want to be that because he had such power and position. And he had people around him reconfirming his false ego. And he became so totally infatuated by that, by the reconfirmation of his own loving citizens, at least he thought they were loving, he really believed it. He believed his ego, and he believed what all these people were saying about him. I'm the doer, see what I have done. To the point where he sent a message to Krishna in Dwarka that I am the supreme absolute truth. I have descended into this world as Vasudev, and you are an imitation. So this to Krishna. He said, you must give up carrying my weapons, the chakra, the club, the lotus flower, the conch shell, the saranga bowl. These are my weapons. Give them up. Stop imitating me. I have descended into the world to kill people like you. If you don't surrender to me, I will destroy you. So the messenger spoke this while Krishna was playing. He was with, he was with the Ukrasena and his devotees. And when they heard this, everyone in the entire assembly hall laughed. <laughs> they were really laughing. They could not take this serious. It was so totally crazy. He's actually saying that Krishna stole his weapons. <laughs> He's saying that Krishna has stolen his position. They know who Krishna is. They just, all they could do is laugh. And they were telling jokes about this message. <laughs> but Pondraka was really serious. And the messenger was serious. And his whole kingdom was under his command. So after all this laughing and joking, which must have really like shaken the messenger, <laughs> he's basically declaring war on Krishna unless Krishna gives up his imitation of him. And Krishna said, I, he said, he gave a message back. Essentially, he said, that I will certainly give up my weapons to kill you unless you surrender. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> and <clears throat> he's asking Krishna to take shelter of him. And Krishna said, unless you give this mentality up, your body will be the shelter of vultures and dogs after it's dead. So it was a good, compassionate um, wake-up call. So the messenger brought that back to Pondraka, and Pondraka started organizing his armies. And he was challenged. Krishna was challenged, so Krishna went to the kingdom, and he was outside the kingdom with his armies, and Pondraka sent two Akshahinis, two full armies, to attack Krishna. And according to Srimad Bhagavatam, Pondraka was very strategic. What kind of god? He was thinking, Balaram is in Vrindava now, and Balaram's very powerful. So I will attack Krishna when Balaram's away. So Pondraka sent his armies, and Krishna sent his Sudarshan chakra and some other weapons. But when he first saw Pondraka, 
He couldn't believe it. <laughs> Pondraka had the exact type of crown that Krishna would wear. He was carrying a sarangabo, just like Krishna's. He had a kostubamani, not the real one. <laughs> Well, you know, you know, even in those days, you know, you can go to stores and get <laughs> <laughs> not real diamonds, but, you know, things that look like real diamonds. He had a costubamani. It was obviously not just a piece of plastic. It was something very special. Everybody else took him serious. And he was wearing yellow-colored upper and lower garments. And he had the same kind of garlands reaching down to his knees. And he had a, a chakra and a club and, a, and Krishna's sword. He was dressed just like Vishnu and Krishna and Dwarka. And Krishna looked at him. And, he's, and he really believes in the core of his heart that Krishna is imitating him. We laugh, but I'll get to that part later, <laughs> but coming very soon. So his entire army was finished. By Krishna just alone, he didn't, Krishna didn't even need his armies, he just sent a couple weapons and destroyed all the two full armies of Pondraksha. And along with Pondrak was the king of Kashi, who was also an extremely powerful king of Varanasi. And he totally believed in Pondraka and completely supported him and was willing to lay down his life and his whole military and everything in support of this false Vasudev. That's how conv convincing this person was. Not only convincing, but convinced. Maya means that which is not. So then Krishna said to Pondraka, you know, surrender. <laughs> and then Krishna destroyed his chariot. And even at that point, Pondraka could have just, it's so rational. If I'm actually God, how, how did this Krishna from Dwarka destroy my armies and destroy my chariot? He could have come to his senses and said, okay, Krishna, I, I give up before I'm dead. But he didn't. Krishna gave, to, up to the last moment, Krishna gave him the opportunity. So Krishna's Sudarshan Chakra took off his head. But Krishna's so merciful. After all, he made it to the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. He was not just an ordinary person. Because he was always meditating on the form of Krishna, he, even in his very um, misconceived way, Krishna sent him to Vaikuntha to be one of his eternal associates with Sarupya Mukti, where he had the same form as Lord Narayan, as a servant of the Lord. So he attained liberation, Vaishnav liberation. And then um, Krishna's arrows cut off Kashiraj's head. Now our Acharyas tell why. Because Kashiraj, the king of Kashi, he, when he left his kingdom to go out and fight with Krishna, he promised everyone 
including his queens and his children and his citizens, because they all worshiped him. He promised them that I will bring back the head of my enemy as to glorify my, the power of myself and Pondraka. In other words, he was going to bring back Krishna's head. That's what he was claiming. So Krishna, with his arrows, he cut off Kashiraj's head and the arrows were so precise that after his head was cut off, they flew in the air through the gate of Varanasi and fell right in the steps of his palace. And all the people were celebrating, thinking, ah, just see what he said is true. He has sent the head of his enemy. And then they looked to see, what, what is this thing anyway? Because it was, didn't kind of look the same. And they were wondering, whose head is this? It must be the head of the enemy. And then they looked at the earrings, and it was Kashiraj's earrings. His son. His son was so angry. Sudakshana that he decided, I must get revenge on my father's death. I must kill whoever has defeated my father. So he performed tapasya and yagya to please Lord Shiva. And Lord Shiva appeared to him and said, you have done so much tapasya and so much puja you've worshipped me according to my satisfaction from the point of view of a demigod so I will give you whatever boon you want what do you want and Sudakshina said I want you to create something that will kill the killer of my father my enemy And Lord Shiva, he spoke, but Sudakshana couldn't understand really the import of what he was saying. He said, you do this Dakshinagni, you do this Yajna, and you worship the Brahmins just according to the Vedic scriptures and the rituals prescribed, and it will create a personality that will kill those who are inimical to the Brahmins. So he was thinking, ah, that's just what I want. And he was so rational. He had faith in Lord Shiva's intentions according to his calculation. Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmani Hitaya Krishna is the most beloved of all the Brahmins and Krishna loves all the Brahmins. He's never inimical toward the Brahmins. But he rationalized in his mind that the Brahmins worship Krishna and Krishna accepts their worship but he doesn't really respect them. He gets puffed up by getting all their worship. So therefore he's inimical toward the Brahmins. Hare Krishna. So he was convinced. So he performed the yagya. And from the yagya, they offered the oblation with all the priests. <laughs> and there, this fiery demon that we've been talking about came out. Now, that fiery demon, what we're about to read, is it attacks Dwarka? Krishna's playing dice. <laughs> when all the people of Dwarka approach him and saying, Krishna, Krishna, save us, save us. What's happening here? And Krishna's laughing. He's, and he didn't even bother with this big demon. He just, just 
looked at Sudarshan, who was standing next to him, and said, take care of it. And Sudarshan, <laughs> he came out, and he was blazing. This fire for people of the earth, this monster that came out by Shiva's benediction, looked like it was the fire of devastation. But when Sudarshan showed his fiery nature, this fire looked like a little match compared to a forest fire. He was so overwhelmed, this demon, that he, under, he didn't even fight. He just retreated. But the nature of these mon tantric, black magic type of creations is when it's sent to kill someone, if it's unable to kill the person it was meant for, it will come back and kill the person that sent it. So the very creation of Sudakshana came back to Varanasi and not only killed Sudakshana, but all the priests who did the yagya. And then Sudarshan followed behind and finished off the rest of the city. Hare Krishna was playing dice. <laughs> now you may ask, well, if Krishna can play dice, then well, can you do all those other things too? <laughs> so then, so then um, Sudarshan comes back and stands again by Krishna's side. And Shukadeva Goswami tells, anyone who hears this narration will be free of all sins. <laughs> well, what's the sin we're talking about, especially in this story? The sin of wanting to, to take the role of being the doer of what we do. You see, on one level, when we talk about Pondraka, we're thinking about those who declare themselves to be God. Or what we may call the Mayavad misconception. And that's there. We should understand that those who claim to be God, it's um, most unfortunate. We are eternally servants of Krishna. God, part and parcel of God. But the spirit that that consciousness comes from is actually within everyone who isn't very deeply purified by devotional service. When we want to be honored and worshipped and glorified and when we want to take the credit even for what we have done thinking that I am the doer then that same element of Pondraka is within us. This is an enemy within. From the historical context of this story we can also identify the enemy within ourselves. What is it that Pondraka and Ravana and Hiranyakashipu and Kamsa and all of these people had in common? They were all extremely powerful. They all had so many followers who were honoring them and glorifying them, and they believed it. Ravana wanted to enjoy Sita. Hiranyakashipu wanted to enjoy the power of being the Lord of the universe. Pondraka wanted to enjoy the unique, um, exclusive role of being the Supreme Personality of God. The Jaladuta prayers, Srila Prabhupada is telling us what a, what a Vaishnava actually is. And this is 
This is the heart of a Vaishnav philosophy. Being a Vaishnav is not just what we accomplish or how we are honored by our accomplishments. It's not about how physically strong or intellectually learned we are. It's not about how many rounds I chant or how many followers I have. Being a Vaishnava is about surrender, Shadarnagati. Surrender means I'm not the doer. To actually recognize that I'm just an instrument of Krishna's power. And whatever good we do, we give credit to our gurus and we give credit to Krishna. That's a Vaishnava. And with that consciousness, there cannot be envy. As long as I want to be the doer, I want to be the one who is honored and worshipped and respected, then that ego, the, sim the natural symptoms of that disease of arrogance is envy and greed. And we make offenses. We see others as our competitors. And this is something that every devotee has within them. Srila Prabhupada, he was saying to Krishna at the beginning, I have no words to speak, only if you speak through me. I have no devotion, I have no knowledge, but you've given me the name Bhaktivedanta. But I have complete faith in your holy name. Now it's up to you to fulfill the purport of the name Bhaktivedanta. Your insignificant beggar, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. I'm your puppet, make me dance. So we should actually be learned to understand what Vaishnav qualities really are. This is the heart of it. Pondraka wanted to make, he had this insatiable need within his mind to feel himself superior to everyone. And that's the nature of the false ego. Therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu describes, if you actually want to chant the holy names in a way that Krishna will reciprocate fully, Trinada Bhisunichina, Taror Iba Sihishnana, Amani Namana Dena Kirtaniya Sadari. Be humble like the grass, tolerant like a tree. Offer respects to others. Don't demand or expect respect for oneself. That's the principle that all the great souls live by. So we have these pondraka tendencies within us. We want to be the enjoyer. We want to be the proprietor. We want to be the controller. We want to take credit for things that we don't even do, but to speak of things we think we've done. Punar Mushtakabhava. We think we can do so many things, and we may accomplish many things, but Krishna can make you into a lion to do great things, but he can make, he can make you a mouse in a second. And if we observe, if we observe how the material world works, how history has unfolded, and how things are truly happening today, we'll see confirmations of these simple truths everywhere. If we're just a little objective, if we put our arrogance aside, we can see Krishna's f confirming these ideas, these principles everywhere. But otherwise, we just become so caught up in the whirlwind of our egos and other people's 
egos, reconfirming our egos, that we lose scope of what our real purpose is. On August 15th, India celebrated Independence Day. And I remember, you see, India and America have many things in common. One is we both have Independence Day. America it's July 4th and India it's August 15th. And there's something in common. We both got independent of Britain. <laughs> yes? Now we're all friends with Britain, but in those days we did, America fought a whole war and hundreds and thousands of people died to get the British out of America. And Gandhi and Subhash Chandra Bose and all the rest of your forefathers, they were fighting and <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't fight wars, but they were demonstrating and they were getting shot, you know, for getting salt and all this stuff. And <laughs> so, you know, victory, very sweet when you have independence. But I was just speaking to someone yesterday when America got independence. I just, should I continue? Just not long ago, I visited the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. It's the most, one of the most famous landmarks of America. And on the Liberty Bell, it is engraved that in this land, all beings are, 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 given, are treated equally. And that's basically the constitutional foundation of America. All men are created equal. And that includes women, at least. That's some people's interpretation. But what was the interpretation? At the time, women had no voting rights. And one-sixth, one out of every six Americans was a slave bought and sold with no rights because they had a different color skin than the majority of people. And that's after we got independence on the basis of all men are created equal. And according to this um, exhibition I saw at the Liberty Bell, one-sixth of America were African-American slaves. And there was a law very simple law. There was a law against killing someone else's slave. Your own slave, you can do anything you want because you own it. So yes, we got independence. <laughs> but you know, who got independence? <laughs> You know, there was the civil rights movement and everything else, you know, people fighting for their freedom, even after independence. And here in India, after independence, there was so much killing and so much death and so many fighting on the basis of different religions and different castes and different so many things. So from a nationalistic perspective, you know, we understand the, the glories of India, but the glories of India are in its spiritual principles. Because these spiritual principles are teaching us a higher, deeper form of independence. Now, Srila Prabhupada really appreciated America's independence because it gave freedom of religion, and through that, there was facility for him to spread Krishna consciousness. And similarly, the independence of India gives certain freedoms that can facilitate. From a spiritual perspective, real independence is independence from the false ego. It's as simple as that. 
birth, old age, disease, and death are going to happen no matter what for the physical body. And it's due to the false ego, then we're identifying with the subtle and gross bodies. Real independence, real renunciation, real freedom is very simple. Bhoktaram jagatapasam sarva loka maheshwaram suhridam sarva bhutanam gyatva mam shanti mrachtati. Because everyone is looking for some sort of peace, and Krishna says true peace is very simple. When you recognize that I'm the controller, I'm the proprietor, and I'm the enjoyer. And what does that mean? We're not. <laughs> when we don't have this ego, when we are not um, taken hostage, even as devotees, by this pondraka tendency within us, When people around us say, oh, you are very nice, and you have accomplished this, and we're thinking, yes, correct. We should be humbled when people praise us. Actually, Krishna's doing. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada gave all credit to his Guru Maharaj. He gave all credits to his disciples. He took no credit for himself in the sense that he was always in that mood. Krishna, I'm your puppet. Make me dance. And that's a Vaishnav. And that's how we should be calculating ourselves. It's not just about looking at everybody else. It's about looking inside myself. What are the true values of a devotee? What are the true qualities of a Vaishnava? These demons that we're reading about in Srimad Bhagavatam, the qualities that they possess are the same qualities in various degrees that every conditioned soul is being controlled by. And we really have to take shelter of Krishna in order to overcome these enemies within ourselves. And how do we do that? By really identifying ourselves as the servant of the servant of the servant. By giving up the futile efforts to be the enjoyer, to be the, to be the person worshipped and honored and controlling. We're not proprietors, we're caretakers of whatever intelligence we have, whatever money we have, whatever abilities we have, whatever family members we have, we're caretakers of God's sacred property to serve in harmony with God's will. When we have that spirit, then we can actually take shelter of Krishna who has descended within his holy names as we chant. And when we actually value those principles and humble ourselves internally in that spirit, then the beautiful teachings of Srimad Bhagavatam and the Leelas of Vrindavan, they actually transform our hearts. The pastimes of Vrindavan will transform our hearts. But this is the spirit. Otherwise, they just they can fill our heads with more ego because we think, oh, I know so much. And I know more than him, and I know more than her, and I know more than anybody. 
the acharyas, where do we ever find acharyas speaking like that? Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Is there anyone? I think we're out of time, so we'll have. We'll have one question. Yes, Krishnananda Prabhu. And I thank you for the wonderful class. I was just wondering in Chaitanya Bhagavad, there's a similar story of Kashi Raj who was uh, killed and then the chakra ran after Lord Shiva. So, is there any connection between the two? Is it the same story? Or? It's the same story. So, this led to Lingraj Mahadev. Yeah, same story. <laughs> Thank you. Very well. Yes, Sri Rama Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, you mentioned about uh, how we should be constantly meditating upon this aspect of being the instrument in God's hands and not the doers. Uh, but but sometimes uh, many of us have this uh, difficulty that in the speed of accomplishing things for Krishna, of course, for Guru and for Prabhupada, there's a speed that we are we need to do things, and because of the speed that at we are trying to in accomplish things, uh, we usually forget this principle of being the doers, and we just get so so caught up and unknowingly we start feeling that we are the doers and we need to do things. So how do we really have the speed to achieve for Krishna because that's required. But at the same time to be constantly uh, aware of this fact and not really wait for such classes to really, uh, you, know, uh, you know, to really wake us up. But uh, to constantly, is, is it that we need to hear this very often or how do we really maintain that consciousness all the time uh, that we are the instruments. Yes, we need to hear it very often. <laughs> <laughs> our service and the speed in which we're trying to do our service is it's our service. We shouldn't be thinking that An example, sometimes devotees say, I'm not pure, so how can I, how can I share this message to another person? First I should become completely pure, then, I, then I'll qualify to actually repeat this message. But Srila Prabhupada explained that if you're just sincere and trying to follow, then whatever you have been given, to share it with another. But don't think that this is my knowledge and I'm so great that I know so much. Srila Prabhupada said that we're just postal peons. We're just delivering a message. And the message is good, even if I'm not so good. <laughs> but to the degree I really try to sincerely and honestly follow this message myself, to that degree people will really feel it more believable. So even in a neophyte state we purify ourselves by just trying to share this message because that's the service we're given. Yes, we're servant. So we have some of us projects and we're trying to do it really well and we're trying to do it as efficiently and as rapidly and as comprehensively as possible. And in doing that, there is, of course, the danger. There's a danger of failure for everything we do, and there's also a danger of success. 
material world, padam padam yad vipadam natesham. We can apply this principle on so many levels. There's danger at every step. Sometimes it's really a challenge when you fail in what you're doing. You work so hard and there's no result. But when you work so hard and there's incredible results beyond your expectations, that's even a bigger challenge. Yes. There's danger at every step. Whether we succeed or fail, victory, defeat, honor or dishonor. If we're dishonored, the danger is we start becoming envious and we start becoming depressed and we start becoming, we, we just give up hope. That's the challenge of dishonor. We become envious. And the challenge of honor is we take it seriously that I'm the doer and that I'm the great and I'm better than others. We become arrogant. And when you become arrogant, you become envious too because there's other people who, who might be succeeding. Yes? So in, if you don't do anything, and think that, you know, I don't want to get honor or worship, so I'm not going to do anything, then your ego's going to be even worse. You're just going to be, oh, I'm useless. Or else you're going to think, I'm just chanting, I'm better than everybody. They're just out doing stuff, but I'm reading Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> Every step. So Prabhupada gave us a really good balance. Work on projects, do things, accomplish things for Krishna. And, and, but, but we have to put quality time aside every day to chant the holy names and actually understand what is Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhagavad Gita, Nasta Praeshya Bhadreshu Nityam Bhagavati Seva. We must hear this message regularly. Prakrite kriyamanani gunai karmani sarabhash. Krishna tells in Bhagavad Gita, bewildered soul thinks themselves the doer of their activities. Very foundational principle. If we understand the Bhagavad Gita, we won't think ourselves the doer of activities. We won't have this ahankar, we won't have this false ego. That's Gita. And Srimad Bhagavatam is all about great souls. Even Yudhisthira Maharaj won the battle of Kurukshetra and became the king of the world, but he had no false ego. <coughs> Krishna, it's all you. Instead of taking the credit for winning the war, he took the blame for all the things that went wrong. <laughs> and Krishna had to preach to him and bring him to Bhishma. That was the mood of a Vaishnav. Yes? So yes, we have to hear carefully. We have to be dynamic, we have to work. That's, that purifies us, but it purifies us when it's balanced with cultivating in the proper association, the proper attitude. Does that answer your question? Radhe Shyam Prabhu, would you like to add anything? <laughs> please, please give to Radhe Shyam. <laughs> Since Goranga Prabhu is telling you to, to say something. <laughs> Gorang, Goranga Prabhu should add something. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, actually, the class was so deep, I'm still contemplating on the class. <laughs> what did you say? Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
here. I will not take credit, but I'm very, <laughs> I'm very grateful for your kind words. Srila Prabhupada Ki Thank you very much.